Good afternoon, friends and newcomers. Welcome to the first virtual session, the first webinar offered by our CSPC committee, that is, our Committee on Contemporary Spiritual and Public Concerns. I'm Jerome Marion, and I have the honor to serve as the president of our CSPC committee. We have been up and running ever since Pentecost 2005, so for 15 years. And now we're taking up this new venture, our first Zoom session. And what a venture it is. For we are about to explore, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the unsung challenges facing the church. That is facing us, the people of faith. We, the people of faith. A challenge facing us both in liturgy and in life. How do we best connect them? And who can model that connection for us. Of course, that nexus, that bridge between liturgy and life, is very much a continuing concern for our committee. After all, we're dedicated to discussing that which is precisely spiritual and public. That is hyphenated because in our Catholic faith, there are these two sides of the coin. We are unreservedly spiritual and public. We are dedicated to faith and to social action, for faith without good works is dead. Our exploration today moves in three quick steps. One, what is our streamlined procedure this afternoon? Two, what is the book that serves as the center of our discussion? And three, who is the author that will guide our discussion of the book? One, what is our streamlined procedure this afternoon? It's as easy as A, B, C. A, we have about three minutes to introduce the book and the speaker. B, the speaker will then address this challenge facing the church for about half an hour. During that time, should a question pop into your mind, please don't hesitate to use the Q&A function on your screen to send us your question. C, as soon as the speaker finishes his address, I'll come back up on the screen and share your questions with him. And speaking of questions, as soon as we finish here, there will be a very short questionnaire for you to fill in and then hit send. That gives us feedback both in today's first virtual session and on what you might like to explore in future sessions. Of course, a lot of logistical work goes into these virtual sessions. So, just as we would thank our many volunteers in the old-fashioned sessions in Di Giovanni Hall, I'd like to thank the two gentlemen responsible for the behind-the-scenes logistical work, to thank Mr. Kevin Kearns, who is assisting our speaker, and to thank Mr. Ryan Tierney, who is assisting me. This presentation simply could not have been made without them. Two. What is the book that serves as the center of our discussion? It is a landmark in its field, and yet it's very accessible. It is brand new from Paulist Press. I can hold it up here so you can see it. Okay. The Deacon, Icon of Christ the Servant, Minister of the Threshold. It's a 193 page paperback and one which you can easily order directly from Paulist Press. Or better yet, order it through one of our local Harvard Square businesses. For example, the Harvard Bookstore, which has understandably been very hard hit by the drastic decline in foot traffic. So ordering from Paul's Press via the Harvard Bookstore would be a doubly good deed. The book itself comes very highly recommended, for example, by Reverend Professor John W. O'Malley, SJ, a friend of my late team teaching partner, Reverend Professor Ray Helmick of beloved memory. We had Father O'Malley here, of course, to speak on Vatican II. And there is a very high accolade indeed for the book, which comes from none other than our very own Cardinal Sean. Three, who is the author that will guide our discussion of the book? Now, The Deacon is a book that stands in a class all by itself. And yet, as I'm proud to note, it was thoroughly researched and objectively written, not by some distant scholar, but by our very own permanent deacon, Timothy O'Donnell. 
It took a lot of research for the challenge that Tim faced, the challenge in liturgy and life was this. For over a thousand years in the West, the Roman Catholic Church had no permanent diaconate. We had the Office of Transitional Deacons, which entailed a year's service for those about to be ordained priests, like our very own transitional deacon, Bobby LeBlanc. But we had no permanent diaconate. It was only at the great Second Vatican Council, opened by Pope St. John the 23rd, good Pope John, in October 1962, that the order of the permanent diaconate would be recreated. We, the people, the pilgrim people of God, have taken up a new venture, a permanent diaconate, facing conditions in liturgy and in life that are very, very different from those faced by the original diaconate in the New Testament and in the early church. What tasks can this recreated diaconate discharge? And what images can best guide the performance of those tasks? In response to that, our deacon, Tim, drew on a very rich set of life experiences in his research and writing. Educated at Phillips Exeter Academy in New Hampshire and here at Harvard, where he read classics, Tim went on to University College London and then returned to Harvard to do his master's in city and regional planning. He then took up real estate finance. He currently co-manages two local commercial mortgage banking firms. Most importantly, for his own life and for his current service as a deacon. While he was studying in Europe, Tim met his wife, Elke. Most importantly, I say, for we have no senior deacon whose wife is not a full-fledged member of the team. Together, Elke and Tim underwent the four-year formation for the diaconate. Tim was ordained in 2011. He and Elke first served up the hill at St. Peter's. And now he and Elke have returned to St. Paul's. Blessed with three children and six grandchildren, they can very well address the full life of the laity as well as the ordained. And now, as I asked Tim to turn on his visual and audio, I think we can safely conclude that in our spiritual life, as in our civic life, as evidenced by my own tie, if you can see it today, we the people, the great opening of our U.S. Constitution, we the people are only as good as we give to one another, and few have given so deeply as Deacon Tim. Tim, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jerome. That was very, very kind, um, everything that you said. And um, I am honored uh, to be um, speaking, uh, as sponsored by the Committee on Spiritual and Public Concerns uh, in such a line of distinguished speakers uh, going back 15 years and from a, uh, a committee that has done so much to enrich discourse about the faith in the parish and beyond. So thank you so much. I'm gonna make some uh, introductory remarks on the, on the book. And um, as has been noted, there is a website, uh, www.thedeaconbook.com, uh, which it's possible to go to. So what I'll be doing before welcoming your questions um, is to uh, address why it is that uh, we have a book, uh, why I'm proposing to write a book about deacons. Um, and the subject of the book is who are deacons and um, what is their job in the church? That is, the, what is their distinctive ministerial identity? Why have deacons in the first place in the church? And in order to address this, I'm gonna do a brief historical survey about the diaconate as an office in the church, um, how we got to where we are today. And I'm gonna look very quickly at those aspects uh, of the full office. There's a functional side, there's a relational side where, where the diaconate is in the church, and there's a sacramental side. And we need to look at all of those to see the kind of diaconate in full. And finally, I'm gonna present the two models 
that I argue in the book can explain and guide the diaconate, icon of Christ the servant and minister of the threshold. So why have a book on the diaconate in the first place? Well, we've had deacons, uh, permanent deacons in the church for 50 years. We have uh, some, some church teaching about who deacons are and what their ministry should be. We have some very good writing on this subject, but the writing tends to be specialized, looking at different aspects of the diaconate and often not standing back and asking uh, how we can see the diaconate in full and its distinctive uh, ministerial identity. And therefore, there's lots of confusion. Um, just as a very down-to-earth example, um, I was ordained in 2011, and for years after Mass, I stand outside the church, people come out, we talk, um, and the most common thing that I've heard over the years is, thank you, Father. Obviously, a deacon's vestments look a lot like a priest's vestments. People are much more used to priests than they are uh, of deacons. Uh, 50 years in the Catholic Church is no time at all. Um, but there is a continuing confusion in people's minds, obviously, as to what a deacon is. Is a deacon some kind of a mini priest, a half priest, or something like that? Uh, it's hard to say. And there's some confusion among deacons themselves about what their ministry in the church uh, should be, um, and certainly among priests and bishops who uh, have not really seen the, the diaconate um, on the ground uh, long enough and with enough kind of theology, lived theology behind it to really understand what it is. So what is it that, uh, wh where does the, uh, the diaconate come from? Well, the word diakonos is a word uh, that refers to somebody who assists somebody else uh, or who acts as somebody's agent. Um, the word minister is quite close to it um, and it can be high or low. That is, it can be a sort of a lowly servant uh, and it could be somebody like a prime minister. So it's a pretty general word, but assistance and acting as the agent of another person are at the center of what the word is. And that's true of the ancient diaconate and it's true of the modern diaconate. However, uh, in other ways, there are differences between them. So the, uh, the diaconate in the ancient uh, church uh, was a permanent ministry alongside that of bishops um, and presbyters uh, who later became, came to be called priests. And the particular functions that deacons had in the ancient church are not very well spelled out in the sources, which don't seem to be interested in kind of giving job descriptions, but they obviously um, helped out um, bishops and priests uh, in terms of uh, the organization and functioning of the uh, gatherings and Eucharistic meals. Um, they seem to have been had a particular area in many churches uh, of uh, pastoral assistance in, in relief of the poor and in bringing perhaps the Eucharist, but certainly um, food and, um, and assistance uh, to people in their homes who were sick and so on. So that's a little bit of a, of a, a sketch of the ancient diaconate. What happened in the West, in the Western church is that over the middle ages, the diaconate really ceased to have a permanent ministry in itself. It became a step towards the priesthood, which was the height of the sacrament of holy orders. Uh, there were really in the middle ages, um, seven stages by which uh, a candidate would finally arrive at the priesthood, um, starting with exorcist and doorkeeper and going through lector, acolyte, subdeacon, deacon, and finally priest. So it was just a step and um, in the East, uh, in the Orthodox churches, um, a permanent diaconate was kept. Um, they also have a, had and have a transitional diaconate uh, as a stage on the way to priesthood. Um, by the third century, there were, had been ordination rites. So it was clear uh, that uh, this was some kind of an ordained ministry, although at some times there was confusion about whether the diaconate was part of the, the, sac the sacrament of holy orders or not. But by the Middle Ages, the diaconate really had become, I would say, a fossil. Um, it was there, uh, but it had no function. Um, it was not a living ministry. 
And it was like, uh, one might say, a bucket uh, that might be uh, filled by something uh, if something came along. So what came along? There was a revival. Um, uh, Jerome's word recreation is probably a very good word, but the, uh, the, the people who pushed this uh, and worked it through in, during the 20th century uh, preferred the word revival. They wanted to make clear that there was a line going back to the ancient diaconate uh, that was being kept. So in the midst, in, during the 20th century, we had an enormous amount of upheaval. Up, up, uh, up, uh, up we, uh, we had war, we had uh, depression and so on. And the, uh, there was also in many parts of the world, not in the United States, but in large parts of Europe and most of the other parts of the world, a, uh, a shortage of priests to do pastoral work. And many people started thinking about what is it that the church can do uh, to uh, meet this pastoral need. And needs came up in three different places. Ah, okay. Thank you, Kevin. Kevin has put the, uh, the screen up in front of me. So um, needs came up in three different places that pointed to three different roles or tasks that ultimately, ultimately would be combined in the office of deacon. The first is that in, in places where there was not a priest uh, easily available, uh, there were laymen who would, who would lead uh, people in prayer, uh, perhaps be sacristan in a church that didn't have uh, a priest uh, assigned to it on a regular basis. So there's an area there of, of prayer and liturgy. The second is that um, the, on a second here. <laughs> Kevin is bringing good things up on my screen. Okay. Um, so uh, the second area is that there were people working in social and relief work in church organizations, particularly the German Caritas, who created diaconate circles. They uh, were inspired by deacons in the early church who gave relief to the poor, and they really thought that their work uh, in, in giving that kind of relief and doing that kind of charitable work would be strengthened uh, if they could be ordained as deacons. And the third area was uh, that uh, in mission lands or in places where the priests were very much uh, few and far between, and this was true in large parts of, uh, of Africa, Latin America, and Asia, there were catechists who were lay people uh, who were uh, teaching people and holding communities together in the absence of priests who might show up once a year. This really is a ministry that grows out of the ministry of the word of teaching the basic faith to people. So from three different directions, we have, uh, we have prayer and liturgy, we have a ministry of charity and a ministry of the word. And the thing that's remarkable is that the people who all thought about these possibilities for the diaconate were saying, perhaps these could be combined in a single ministry, which would be the diaconate, which is still an existing office, a sort of an empty bucket uh, that we could put these things into uh, to meet the, the current pastoral needs of the church. Um, Kevin, if you're moving this, can you move to the next slide? Thank you. Nothing really probably would have happened uh, with this um, if uh, uh, Pope St. John had not called the, the Second Vatican Council, which uh, brought these questions to the fore. There was an extensive debate um, the, the Second Vatican Council was from 1962 to 65, and in the fall of 1964, there was an extensive debate on whether uh, the ancient office of deacon might be revived for these pastoral needs. Uh, cases were made for and against. I go over them uh, in the book. It's, it was a very interesting debate. There were over 100 speeches that dealt with this. Um, Ultimately, the decision was made by a large majority uh, to revive the ancient office. Big issue was the question of celibacy. Um, there was a concern that if, um, uh, if uh, married men were allowed to become deacons, 
uh, that they might decide not to be priests and that would drain recruits for the priesthood. So uh, the compromise that was made was that uh, any younger men who were going to become deacons um, would, would have to be celibate, but those, as the council document said, of mature age um, could be married and become deacons. Um, Pope uh, Paul VI ultimately um, set that age at 35 years old. Um, and the third thing was that uh, the, uh, the council document uh, uh, proposed implementing this uh, revived diaconate through bishops' conferences. If the bishops' conference uh, wanted no deacons, they didn't have to have permanent deacons. Um, if they wanted to, they could petition the Pope and the Pope would give them permission to do that and they, they could then ordain permanent deacons. So it would not be something that would be done everywhere. And in, in fact, um, it is uh, mushroomed in some places and it's almost unknown in other parts of the worldwide church. The key questions um, from here, because there was no diaconal ministry on the ground was who were these deacons going to be? Um, what sort of people were they going to be? And what is their job in the church? The uh, pastoral, the um, uh, dogmatic constitution on the church, Lumen Gentium, which was um, approved uh, by the council in November 1964, um, uh, made a first stab at these questions by saying uh, what the deacon's job was going to be, that these three ministries uh, of, word, um, uh, um, of, of word, uh, ministry and charity uh, would be combined. We'll get to that in a moment. And it points to the idea that the deacon would be an example of Christ the servant. Can we have the next one, Kevin? Thank you for this. Uh, can we move on to the next one after this? Okay, so um, Lumen Gentium uh, begins uh, by looking at the people of God, the church itself. It talks about the church in general before uh, moving on uh, to uh, the hierarchy, uh, those um, who have been uh, ordained through holy orders of uh, bishops, uh, priests, and deacons. And um, Episcopal uh, uh, consecration is the height of the sacrament of orders, its fullness, and it, uh, it confers on the bishop uh, the faculty of, um, of teaching, sanctifying, and governing the people of God. So that's the highest point of, um, of the sacrament of order. Uh, and priests basically stand in for the bishop in the place where they are in local communities. Um, they sanctify and govern under the bishop's authority. Um, they obviously pass on the teaching of the bishop. So they're a more limited form of teaching, sanctifying and governing. Um, then in section 29, we come to the deacons. And um, the, the document says that the lower level of the hierarchy are deacons upon whom hands are imposed, not for the priesthood, but for the ministry. Strengthened by sacramental grace in communion with the bishop and his group of priests, they serve in the, diacony, in the, in the diaconate of the liturgy of the word and of charity. Notice that while priests and bishops teach, sanctify and govern that uh, deacons have the, have the ministries of the word, of liturgy, and of charity. So word and liturgy are more limited um, uh, manifestations of sanctifying um, and teaching. But charity is a complete substitution for governing. In other words, deacons are involved in, in the church's work of charity uh, and outreach and not involved in the church's governing, that the deacons are not part of ecclesiastical powers. Um, and that's already um, emphasized at the lower level of the hierarchy are the deacons, the way this starts. Um, and it's not priesthood, it's a ministry of service. So uh, the document then goes on to give a number of things that deacons can do. And a lot of them are in the ministry uh, of liturgy um, that they can baptize um, and uh, bring communion to people and so on and so forth. So there's a whole number of things there. 
But at the end of this paragraph, uh, the document comes back down to the, this important point. What's the center of gravity in the deacon's ministry? That he's dedicated to the duties of charity and administration. Whoops, we had governing that became charity. Now we have administration, which is a more limited form of leadership. Again, it's not power, it's just uh, administration. And, and then uh, the, the document goes on to give just a sketch uh, what the deacons uh, should represent within the church. Uh, quoting uh, the very early church father, Polycarp, who says, let the deacons be mindful of the ab admonition of Polycarp to be merciful, diligent. And uh, Kevin, it's not on the screen here, but walking to the truth of the Lord uh, who became uh, the servant of all. So what this is suggesting um, in its final summation is that the center of the, of the uh, deacon's ministry uh, is to be an image of Christ the servant. Okay, next slide. So if we take the, the diaconate as a church office in, in its entirety, it has three parts. There's a functional part. Uh, it does matter what deacons do. It's not just who they are, it's what they do. And these three tasks of word, liturgy, and charity are combined. That is, the deacon takes on all of those tasks um, and also takes them on in a way that they imply and reinforce each other. Um, when the deacon, for example, is uh, bringing uh, communion to somebody who is uh, at home and doing prayers with them, um, that is a, a task of charity, which is also a task of liturgy, but he's bringing with him um, that, that uh, altar service, um, that ministry in the church, uh, which is part of this and implied by it. So this is a way that the, that the different tasks, whether it's uh, talking about the faith, teaching, he's coming out of the place that he's been in liturgy and so on, that the different tasks are the, 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 um, the combination, the sum is greater than the parts. And the second part is relational. Uh, the deacon is put in a different, a, a new position in the church, in, in, and it's a permanent relation of uh, public commissioning uh, to serve the church and the gospel permanently. He makes a, um, uh, a, uh, a vow of uh, obedience to the bishop um, and is in this very particular um, position in the church which prior to ordination, he was not in. And the third is sacramental and really in two senses. One is the deacon um, uh, receives the sacrament of holy orders. Um, this is a, a laying on of hands, which um, brings him into inclusion in the apostolic ministry with bishops and priests. But there's also a larger sacramentality about this, that he is charged to be a sign or example for the church. Um, and so the question is an example of what? Next slide. Okay, so what I'm proposing in the book is that um, what the deacon uh, is to be an example of um, is of two models that I've proposed. And I'm gonna give a picture for each one of these, uh, both uh, pictures from the ministry of Christ uh, in which the ministry of the deacon as of any Christian disciple is rooted and uh, the first, that of Christ the servant, um, let's think about that for a moment. Um, all Christian disciples are called on to serve God, to serve one another. Um, and all bishops and priests are called on uh, to serve the people of God. So service uh, is not something that only deacons have. We have all of us as Christian disciples or as leaders in the church um, are called to service. But there are some things in the whole, in the structure of the office of deacon, in the way that it's positioned, um, that um, bring this out uh, more clearly. They intensify it, and so that Christ the servant can be made more distinct by this um, exemplification. So think of this. First of all, in the liturgy, uh, the deacon's role is an assisting or serving role. The deacon prepares the altar, 
uh, purifies vessels, uh, obviously is not in the presiding or gathering role, is not in the oversight role, but in an assisting role. In the deacon's position in the church, this is, there's a public permanent promise and commissioning to serve the bishop and the church. Um, so again, the, the service aspect um, of the deacon's ministry is foregrounded there. The whole distance from ecclesiastical power, um, there aren't special powers and faculties that the deacon has, particularly not of presiding or governing. Um, and in, in this particular emphasis on charity and works of charity, um, there's something in the, in the deacon's ministry on the call to serve uh, what my wife Elka has always uh, called, well, the last, the least, and the lost. And this is how Jesus served the Father and humankind in his ministry. So there's also a style of leadership. Um, deacons um, don't do governing, uh, but um, anyone with a position like this in the church uh, is uh, um, um, helping on others uh, and pr providing some leadership. And the style is humble, but not servile and is very much oriented towards enabling others. So the office is structured to exemplify this aspect uh, of the person and ministry of Christ. It's already in Lumen Gentium, but it's been appealed to constantly in church documents and theological treatments and uh, retreats and so on. Uh, this is a well-known uh, aspect of diaconal identity, which I've simply tried in the book to give uh, greater theological grounding to and a more concrete uh, definition. Uh, so Kevin, next slide, please. Okay, so the second uh, model uh, that I'm proposing as the other side of the diaconate that the two of them together uh, can express um, and uh, the full ministry of the deacon is the minister of the threshold. Now the threshold is the lower sill of a doorway. You can imagine yourself standing in the doorway, so you're between one place and another, or of crossing over it, of going from one place to another. And the point that I'm making here is that the ministry of the deacon is characteristically um, um, uh, exercised in a threshold area like this. The picture that I've chosen to um, try to impress this on your mind, this unfortunately was not in the book, um, nor was the other, uh, but here we have uh, Jesus with the Samaritan woman. I'll come back to this in a moment, but this idea of a minister of the threshold picks up various strands of people uh, thinking about envisioning the diaconate, uh, trying to understand what it was um, after it was um, being uh, performed on the ground. Um, oh, but already some of the activists talked about the deacon um, as a kind of a bridge figure. Um, someone between the higher clergy and uh, the people of God. Um, and the book attempts to bring all these various strands together um, and to ground them uh, theologically and in a practical sense in, mini in ministry. Jesus as a threshold figure, as we see here, characteristically in his ministry um, moves from one place to another and cross, crosses thresholds in a number of different ways. Here we see one that's characteristic. We have Jesus um, has crossed over into Samaria out of the land of Israel um, in, the, in the course of his ministry. Um, he is um, uh, having a, um, a, a conversation of depth uh, with a woman alone. This crosses a gender threshold in this society. This was not a common thing to do, um, even a questionable thing to do. And also the woman is a notorious sinner. So the uh, position of a religious teacher to be having a conversation with somebody like that crosses a threshold. So where do we see this in the ministry of the deacon? Well, first of all, the deacon lives and ministers in an in-between place. He's permanently ordained as clergy, but typically uh, lives like the rest of the people of God and also those outside the church. 
the vast majority of deacons, um, there are 46,000 now in the world, 17,000 um, in the United States and Canada, the vast majority are married with families and they earn a living um, in a non-church job. Some do earn livings in church jobs as chaplains, as uh, DREs and so on, but almost all of them um, earn a living in a non-church job. And therefore they're placed on the boundary or threshold of the church an in between back and forth place um, in which their ministry is the center of gravity uh, it's, it's, it's grounding uh, is in altar service and in prayer, uh, but its movement um, is out towards the boundaries of uh, the gathered church. So um, in the first place, um, I should just mention quickly that um, the, um, uh, the situation of being married is very typical for deacons. Um, uh, Jerome uh, is absolutely understands perfectly the importance of that um, for me in my life. Um, Elka and I have been married over 40 years. Um, but in particular, uh, we have been together in this adventure of uh, diaconal ministry from the beginning in so many uh, pastoral encounters that we have had together. I've relied on her advice and gifts, her creativity. Um, it would have been uh, completely different without her. And this is something, this aspect of marriage and the diaconate is something that I could not go into in, in depth in this book. Uh, it would really require um, another book. But it's very important for the deacon's um, grounding. So the deacon also finds himself um, ministering in the workplace, in the family, on the sports field, um, in civic groups. Um, and the hope is that uh, a deacon is able to bring a certain presence, not just of a Christian disciple, that yes, but also some presence of the church, of the, uh, of the gifts of the church, um, uh, implicitly of the sacramental gifts, of the proclamation of the gospel, and so on. And within the church, uh, the focus of diaconal ministry is very much on those who are on the edge, those who may be overlooked, um, those who by discouragement or sickness or grief or doubt um, are forgotten or invisible or in some ways uh, apart from the sort of central part of the, uh, of the community. And the deacon's distance from ecclesiastical power, the fact that the deacon shares life conditions with, um, with everybody else um, should bring some kind of availability, some uh, hospitality, some attraction uh, that could make, that makes people um, willing to enter into some kind of dialogue with the faith on a deeper level. So I'm going to leave it at that so that we have time for questions. Jerome, could you uh, come on? Okay. Can you hear me now? Can he Yes, I can hear you and right. see you. Oh, even better. Two dimensions. What do you know? Um, first, I wanted to say, uh, just myself saying this, that I thought you really did a very nice summary of 193 pages that were really jam-packed. That's tough to do. I know every time I have to give a lecture in class and I've assigned a book, how do you cover the book in one class type situation? So hats off. I thought I might actually start with one question, which would be my own, and then we have some very nice questions from our listeners, and that is, you were very, very uh, discreet about this in your book, but while the model of Christ, the servant, was the popular image, certainly in Vatican II, and is still the popular image among many theologians, the image of the threshold and how the deacon really is moving in many different directions from that threshold is one that you have perhaps developed more than anyone else I can think of offhand, even at BC, and you cite some BC folks uh, very, very nicely. So my thought is, why not tell us a little bit more about how you yourself came to the threshold? Okay, well, uh, as, I, as I said, how I myself came to the threshold um, 
Well, from my experience, let me, I'll give a couple of examples from experience. Um, so here's, here's ministry um, in the workplace. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I co-manage two uh, smallish firms and I, uh, I am uh, in interaction with people all the time. And an example of this is that um, uh, one of my colleagues uh, whose uh, father, uh, she's kind of on the, the edge of the church, but her father is very um, pious and he has a statue of Our Lady of Fatima that he, he wants blessed. Um, she offers to bring it to me. She brings it to the office. I bless the statue. I think she's pretty amazed at um, how, um, uh, how strongly I feel and about blessing this and what an important thing it is. Um, things like that happen in the workplace. Um, if you're a deacon in the workplace all the time, people know that and, and this sort of thing happens. Um, Another thing that has been interesting is that I, I have had a, a couple of friends, um, several friends actually, who have asked me to do burial services uh, for parents. Uh, these are people who are not Catholic or Christian necessarily, or not, don't, maybe don't quite know what they are, um, but um, I'm a person that they feel uh, because I'm a deacon, this is something that I would be able to do, and I am able to do this. Um, and um, uh, so those are a, a couple of things that you see sort of outside the church where you're really on the threshold of the gathered church. Great. Uh, I appreciate that. Now we have a slew of questions here. I'm going to start with a question from a recent graduate from Harvard, since I just gave credit to BC. So let's be fair and even handed. And it's from a very, very sharp recent grad, even by Harvard standards. And here I'm going to read it in full because it's good. Thank you for a wonderful talk, Deacon O'Donnell. Regarding the role of the deacon as a minister of the threshold, following specifically on the last question, yeah. you mentioned that this quote unquote in-between position may make the deacon more approachable to the members of the community. Does existing in this threshold space leave you feeling less anchored? Or is that flexibility itself empowering? I would say that the flexibility, that, that, the, the, that in-between place is a challenging place. Um, and um, uh, it's a challenging, adventurous, exciting place, not always an easy place to be. Um, there are people who are, for example, I'm angry at the church, um, who may see me as a representative of, of, of the church and get angry at me in the process. So it's not always um, an easy or peaceful place, um, but it is, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a dynamic and creative place and one where, you know, through discernment and prayer, uh, I find I just need to keep on trying to um, understand how to do it. Okay, thank you. Now, there's a question here that is a very good one for people, particularly at St. Paul's, who have seen recently both a transitional deacon and, of course, yourself as a permanent deacon. Here's yep. the question. So, there are still transitional deacons. Do they have this same ministerial identity? So, that's a, it's a very good question. Um, and I, I should mention that, uh, that the Anglicans and the Orthodox um, have transitional deacons um, as well as permanent deacons as well. So it's not only a Roman Catholic question. Um, the ordination rite is exactly the same. So in terms of, the, uh, of that sacramental part of it, there is no difference. The reality um, is that uh, a transitional deacon uh, does not at all have um, the kind of is not being formed in the kind of ministerial identity that I've outlined here. Um, the transitional deacon is basically training to be a priest. So the orientation is towards priesthood. Um, and what the, um, the ministerial identity here is really towards diaconate, um, not um, defined in contradistinction to priesthood, toward priesthood, but identified in itself. Um, I think there is um, a tension and a challenge here. Um, it's, it's, there is uh, perhaps even an inconsistency 
Um, mm. How can the same sacrament of holy orders be given to two people um, with such different real life ministerial um, um, callings? Oh, we may send a note to Rome about that. Yes, see what they can say in the long term. It's clear that people are tracking the conversation as we go along because our next question follows right on. If we're looking at you on the altar and we're looking at Bobby on the altar, what is the difference between diaconal and priestly vestments and what is the significance? Okay, well, I had a... I, <laughs> there we go. Th thank you, Kevin. I had a slide <laughs> on this. Um, so the, um, uh, a priest has a stole which goes around the neck and straight down. And uh, the outer vestment is a chasuble uh, which has no sleeves. It is open on both sides. Uh, the deacon's stole uh, goes um, over the hip and comes down. So it goes across rather than straight down. Uh, and the deacon wears a dalmatic uh, which has sleeves. Very good. So that, yes, that's that. what the differences are. I like that. Now we're going to have a slightly more involved question, as it were. In one second, I'll read it to you because I just lost my screen again. Um, it's one of those funky things when you're doing Zoom, you never know what's going to happen next. It's uh, quite an adventure. This question goes as follows. In light of diaconal identity as a minister of the threshold, so you see they're still following your big point yep. here, where do you locate the role of the deacon in the new evangelization of Pope St. John Paul II? And then, of course, in the going to the peripheries of beloved Pope Francis. Um, I'd, say, I'd say right in it. In other words, um, these, um, uh, these visions of how we are, we are all challenged as a church are for all of us. They are not specifically for um, any, uh, you know, one religious order, or any one uh, office in the church or anything. They really are for all of us. I think um, that the, the understanding of, um, and I think this is a self-understanding that deacons have of, of their ministry has been formed by the new evangelization, the vision of the new evangelization of that of that missionary tension that the church is in. And so uh, we are very much on board and being agents of that. Not the sole agents, not the leaders, not the main agents, but very much like that. That, you know, Pope Francis's vision of the move to the periphery, um, which is um, also quite aimed at uh, priests and bishops um, of, you know, you would talk about move out from the rectory and so on. That's a very diaconal, a vision of the church. So again, I, I think deacons are very much um, in and, and part of those movements and are, are being sustained by those, by those visions. And someone who I saw just at the 7.30 mass this morning has just weighed in, following up again. So this is quite the dialogue here. Could you, deacon, describe your own preparation for becoming a deacon precisely? Okay. So, um, in the Archdiocese of Boston, um, and I, th I think this is, um, it, it's done a little bit differently in different places. Um, so formation uh, is a course of four years. Um, and uh, the, the, um, the candidates are, um, are all working at the same time. So the, the formation needs to work um, with that. Um, extensive academic classes uh, take place uh, two evenings um, uh, a week uh, for two and a half hours. And um, there are uh, retreats. There is an internship, typically a hospital internship, sometimes in a prison. Um, there, is, um, there are formation days and um, other kinds of things. So it's, it's very uh, intensive um, and uh, it's going along with work and family life and almost every candidate's um, you know, got a, a full uh, load of that. Um, uh, Elka, who um, was involved in, in this all the way through the four years, I think um, uh, has been always been right in calling it something like boot camp. Hmm. I can relate to that. Great. 
Our last couple questions here start with the following. In your last answer, you used the word leadership. And of course, it also occurs in your book. How would you see deacons carving out for themselves their own unique form of leadership? Well, I think the, um, uh, the particular diaconal style of leadership uh, is, um, is participatory. It's focused on service. Uh, it's focused on enabling. Um, so, but you know, the interesting thing about that is that, um, and uh, Deacon Bill Deitwig has written about this in a number of places that uh, if, you, if you look at some of the secular literature today on leadership, there's a lot in there about service, about enabling other people. Um, and, you know, uh, so the diaconal style of, of leadership in the, in the church is very much um, of, a, of a type uh, with um, uh, some of the best leadership models that are out there today. Okay. The next question, as we come right toward the end here, there are many deacons in some parts of the world, but not in others. Which parts and why? Well, that's it's a very interesting thing. So the um, the diaconate uh, it was um, expected to uh, probably uh, grow most in the places where there was a shortage of priests because there was a, a, a sort of a pastoral void to fill. Um, and that certainly would have been in Latin America. The Latin American bishops at Vatican II were uh, tremendous supporters of uh, the permanent diaconate. Um, the American bishops had almost no interest in it at all. We had plenty of priests um, at that time. Um, and um, there was, they were sort of split in Africa and Asia, but the thought was that maybe those were the places that it would grow the most. Um, what actually happened is the opposite, that uh, the uh, permanent diaconate grew up primarily uh, in Western Europe and North America. Um, of the 46,000 uh, deacons in the world today, I think 77% are in um, North America, excluding Mexico, and in Western Europe. And uh, you know the, the rest are sort of scattered in other places. Um, I think there are two reasons for that. One is <clears throat> that the diaconate tended to grow up not where there was a priest shortage, but in, in, a, in places where the number of priests suddenly plummeted and therefore there was um, a pastoral need. So, and that was the case in Western Europe and in, and in the United States in the period from 1970 until the present. That's one reason. The other is um, the problem of doing formation, what you brought up before, um, is very difficult uh, if you're recruiting uh, candidates who are um, uh, already involved in work and family, you want to give them a proper formation. They're going to be preaching. They're going to be teaching the faith. Um, and so it needs to be fairly rigorous. And that's, uh, it costs money to do that. Uh, there was no tradition of uh, uh, theological education outside seminaries at the time of Vatican II. So that all had to be sort of put together uh, diaconate formation programs needed to be put together. Um, and as I say, all of that costs money and uh, people have to have um, the uh, uh, deacons who are, or, or the candidates who are undergoing the formation uh, need to have, uh, be able to earn a reasonable living outside in order to do this as well. As a result, um, for that reason too, the diaconate tended to grow up in the places um, where formation could be more easily organized, which was the richer countries. So for both of those reasons, um, those are the places that the, that the diaconate has grown most. There are quite a, a good number of deacons in uh, Chile and Mexico. Um, and uh, there's one other Latin American country where there are a large number, um, but there's, um, again, the great preponderance um, is has been uh, in Western Europe and North America. And I simply say in, in, um, in connection with that, that it has created a particular problem. And that is that um, the real uh, danger for developing a distinctive 
effective, um, uh, ecclesially and theologically grounded um, identity for deacons, um, the real challenge for doing that is to ground it in, in the diaconate somehow um, and not as uh, in relation to the priesthood. You have to say in contradistinction to the priesthood, which is about presiding, about, about governing, about bringing together the community and so on, that the deacon's role is different. So you have to make those different. But time and again, uh, people, people ask me, well, so you're a deacon, that means uh, you can baptize and you can do uh, weddings, but what, what can't you do? Um, and so this is a way of saying you're some form of a mini priest or semi priest. Um, and that's the wrong way to approach this. Uh, because uh, the calling to be a deacon, the identity of a deacon, what a, what a deacon is and does is distinct and um, is a particular ministry in the church. And that's really what I've worked hard with this book to try to, um, to foreground. Right. Mini priesthood was obviously one of the terms you most abhorred in the book. That was quite clear and quite right. Yeah. As we move toward the end and people submit their last questions, the next question is a particularly hot one in Rome. As you know better than most, uh, Pope Francis has had one commission that's addressed this question, and there's another commission coming up on the very same question. What are we to make of there being some women in New Testament epistles referred to as, quote unquote, deacons. Do you think the ordained diaconate will ever be open to women? If you need to, take the fifth. <laughs> so um, so let, let me just sort of uh, talk about where the church is on this and, and uh, what um, my argument on diaconal identity, how that relates to it, because that's really what I'm talking about here. Um, at the Second Vatican Council in the 1960s, in the 1950s, this question simply did not come up. Um, there has been discussion and debate since, and um, in uh, 2003, the International Theological Commission issued a document on the diaconate. It was written by a committee, um, and it addresses this question by saying, um, it is an open question. Um, we would need magisterial guidance on it. There is a practice in place now, but um, uh, there is not a, a, a defined magisterial position. So um, the debate has continued. Um, Pope Francis has um, uh, uh, taken it up with commissions and, um, and that's really where it stands today. Um, the diaconal identity that I have argued for in the, in the book, which I think is complete, um, icon of Christ, the servant minister of the threshold. The images that we use in these models, um, servant and threshold, don't point to man or woman. So this, isn't, this doesn't move the dial on that question at all. It really doesn't address that question. Um, as, a, um, as a possibility, I do talk about it in the, in the final chapter of the book um, and uh, send the reader, I, I talk about the arguments that are made for and against and send the reader uh, to some of the literature on it. But yeah. the, the diaconal identity uh, is not something that, um, as I say, moves the dial or is dispositive on this question one way or the other. Yeah. And I think in the introduction, we noted that you were very objective in treating some of these questions where there can be a very strong emotional stance one way or another on the issue. Yeah. You also noticed, and this is something that uh, is really quite heartwarming to see, that in Vatican II, it was the Latin American bishops who were very keen on the recreation of a diaconate, whereas Francis Cardinal Spellman, among others, was quite able to contain his enthusiasm. So this question actually does come from a Latin American, and it asks, Deacon Tim O'Donnell, thank you for your work and your efforts on this book. Stupendous work. Pope Francis has raised concerns on the importance of sustainability in the realm of finance and business, just as you would know with your everyday work. 
how have you, or can you even for that matter, incorporate these notions of service and threshold in your day job and in industry? In other words, how does your formation as a deacon then spill over and raise up your day job? Well, I think, first of all, um, in the whole world of work that any of us is involved in, we, um, we uh, struggle to do the best we can to, to approach everything as a Christian disciple. That's the bedrock. Um, I think with respect to being a deacon, what it does is it just raises the bar. There's no place to hide. I mean, um, when I was ordained, everyone in my two companies came to the ordination. Right. Everybody knows I'm a deacon. So uh, if, if somebody thinks I'm trying to pull a fast one or something, they're very likely to say deacon. <laughs> so I, I think it, it just raises the bar on being a Christian disciple and the challenge that we all have. I'd like very much on behalf of our entire audience, which has obviously been an energetic audience from these questions and a very closely following audience in the sense that they tracked one question right after another based on what you were answering to say, thank you very much for this. And also, I think I speak on behalf of everyone when I say we're going to look forward very keenly to see the sort of response your work, which is the first in its field, it's a landmark in its field, what sort of response, in other words, your book begins to command among theologians and among the informed laity. I hope it will be a vivid and uh, wonderful discourse that you have just triggered. Thank you. Could I mention one thing before we, we uh, go? Um, this uh, talk um, and conversation uh, will be put on the um, St. Paul Harvard Square YouTube channel. So if there are people who uh, you know, who uh, you think would be interested, they can go and find it there in the future. Many thanks all around to our audience, to our deacon and to our two assistants. Good, thank you.